Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're exploring the horrifying true life world of serial killers. And we're starting with the most disturbing serial killers that the world has ever known. I'd go off into fantasy worlds that you'd never want to share with anybody because they're so cruel. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're examining the 20 most terrifying and disturbing serial killers. Well, the point of that is I never told anybody to win. The more you listen to Samuel Little, the more horrific the story becomes. For this list, we'll be looking at the creepiest multiple fatality felons that kept us up late at night due to their terrible actions and unsettling behavior. Which of these appall you the most? Dennis Rader. Having named himself BTK after his modus operandi, for 20 years, Raider was a massive thorn in the side of the police in Kansas. When BTK came forward, everybody's life changed. He would see a woman walking and he would say, she's next. Like the infamous Jack the Ripper, he sent mocking letters to the cops and media. But in person, Raider seemed nice. He had a loving family and was the president of his local church congregation. His first victims were the Otero family in 1974 and his 10th and last victim was Dolores Davis in 1991. Then he dropped off the map, but in 2004 he began taunting them once again. However, he got sloppy with a floppy disk, and it was traced to his church. He asks the police in one of the communications, what if I were to give you a floppy disk with more details of the killings? Um, could you identify me. In 2005, Raider pleaded guilty and got 10 consecutive life sentences. Robert Hansen. As a teenager, Robert Hansen would take part in hunting to escape his rough home life. But as he got older, his victims went from animals to human beings. He would abduct women, often sex workers, and assault them before driving or flying them out to the wilderness. Here was where he would hunt them down like prey, toying with their lives. Nicknamed the Butcher Baker by the media, Hansen was confirmed to have assaulted and killed at least 17 women. In his confession, Hansen described how he would take his victims into the woods and hunt them as prey. In 1983, a teenage sex worker named Cindy Paulson was set to be on that list. However, she managed to escape when he was stalking his plane and alerted the authorities who would arrest him. He received a sentence of 461 years and died in prison after serving 31 years. After his sentencing, Hansen accompanied troopers into the field to find more of his victims, represented by X's on his map. Israel Keys. What's most terrifying for the police and the public is a killer with no MO. But to make things worse, how about one who was also trained by the US Army? This was the case of Israel Keys. I would let them come to me this remote area. Come, come go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live, but that other people go to as well. Across the country, Keyes had set up kill kits, which gave him access to equipment wherever he decided to attack someone. After he killed 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, the FBI was able to track his bank account use and make an arrest following the demand for a ransom. Police arrested 34-year-old Israel Keys 4,000 miles away in Texas. Once he was in custody, however, it was discovered that Keys was responsible for the murder of multiple victims. We did spend a fair amount of time talking about his crimes and his offenses as, as well, and those were those times were definitely um, very chilling to hear him talk about what he's done. Before he faced trial in 2012, Keys took his own life and taking with him information that might have been used to solve other crimes. Marcel Petio. With France under German occupation in the 1940s, Marcel Petio, a doctor, preyed on those attempting to escape persecution. Later claiming he was working for the resistance, even though there was no evidence, Petio set up a fake escape route under the name Dr. Eugène. In the midst of the German occupation during World War II, Petio is considered a hero for operating a secret escape route for Jewish people attempting to leave Paris. He gave those running a fake vaccine containing cyanide before stealing their valuables and disposing of their bodies. 23 remains were discovered, but Petio's lifetime victim count is suspected to be as high as 60, if not higher. 
In 1946, Petio was executed by guillotine, which was still the country's method of capital punishment at the time. His last words, gentlemen, I ask you not to look. This will not be very pretty. Karl Denka. Born in modern-day Poland in 1860, Karl Denka appeared to be a beloved member of his community. After all, they nicknamed him Papa as he let homeless people live in his house for free and volunteered at his local church for a time. But away from prying eyes, he held a very dark secret. In 1924, a badly injured Vincenz Olivier alerted townsfolk that he was attacked by Denka. While the authorities didn't believe him, they later arrested their stand-up citizen as they investigated. Shortly after, Denka took his own life. The police then found human remains of at least 30 people in his house, some of which were made into items. There's also speculation Denka sold the remains to unsuspecting locals. Joseph James D'Angelo Police officers are meant to be honorable and find justice for victims, not cause a wake of destruction like Joseph James D'Angelo. For decades, Joseph James D'Angelo was America's most wanted man, the Golden State Killer. In 1976, he began his spree of assaults and burglaries in Sacramento, California. In the space of three years, he had committed 50 attacks. By 1978, D'Angelo progressed by slaying Brian and Katie Majori. He morphed into the original Night Stalker and later the Golden State Killer before the crime stopped in 1986. Then, in 2018, the police used genetic genealogy from the DNA found at D'Angelo's crimes to trace it back to him. The search takes uh, anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Within a day, I had the list of potential uh, relatives uh, to the Golden State Killer. In 2020, amongst several charges, he pled guilty to 13 murders as part of a deal to avoid capital punishment and got a life sentence. But tonight, the Golden State Killer muttering this apology to his victims. And I'm truly sorry. Moments later, Joe D'Angelo was sentenced to life without parole. Dean Corll. After leaving the Army in 1965, Dean Corll returns to Houston, Texas to work in the family candy business. He was known to hand out free treats to children, earning him the nickname Candyman. Known as the Candyman. Because of his family's sweet shop that used to be across from a school off 22nd Street. Shortly after, he began a relationship with the underage David Owen Brooks. When Corll began his killing spree in 1970, Brooks helped him select victims. Coral then got Elmer Wayne Henley involved too. In 1973, after slaying 28 people, Coral decided to take out Henley along with two other victims. The teenager managed to convince Coral that he was on his side. But when the opportunity arose, Henley fatally shot his former mentor. Both Brooks and Henley received multiple life sentences. David Parker Ray. Sometimes killers go that extra terrifying mile with their modus operandi. David Parker Ray modified a trailer that would be labeled his toy box. The trailer was soundproofed and filled with instruments for his violence. It, he called it uh, the den of Satan. He would abduct women, abuse them for months in the trailer, and presumably eventually end their lives, sometimes with accomplices, one of them being his girlfriend, Cynthia Hendy. In 1999, a woman managed to escape the toy box after three days and get help from a neighbor. That's what I went to. And these, I mean, you deserve to have these people to know what happened. The police immediately arrested Ray and Hendy. On a plea deal, Ray was sentenced to 224 years in jail, while Hendy, who testified against her former partner, got 36 years. It's unknown how many women Ray killed, but some estimates are upwards of 60. He claimed to have abducted 40 women from across the U.S. Since no bodies were ever found, he was never charged, and he never will be. Ray died in prison in 2002 by heart attack. Edmund Kemper. At six foot nine, Edmund Kemper was an intimidating figure. I was dreaming, thinking, fantasizing murder all day long. I couldn't get it out of my head. But with his gentle demeanor, he seemed harmless. However, as a teenager in 1964, he fatally shot his grandparents. Five years later, he was released from a psychiatric hospital and went to live with his abusive mother, Clarinelle Strandberg. 
By 1972, Kemper began driving around Santa Cruz, California, picking up young women who were hitchhiking. He would act impatiently, which enticed them inside the vehicle since they believed he was too busy to be an attacker. In custody, Edmund Kemper would reveal to investigators the full horror of his extraordinary crimes in minute and graphic detail. But he was. This M.O. earned him the nickname the Co-Ed Killer. In 1973, he brutally killed his mother and her friend before handing himself to the police. With 10 victims altogether, Kemper received a life sentence. Andre Chikatilo. Having grown up in difficult circumstances in rural Ukraine under USSR rule, something broke in Andre Chikatilo. But to the outside world, all seemed okay. He had a wife, two kids, and began working as a school teacher in 1971. As a teacher, the 34-year-old hoped to find acceptance and respect, and yet instead he found constant humiliation. His students didn't take him seriously. They refused to behave and smoked right in front of him in the classroom. But not long after getting the job, Chikatilo began assaulting pupils. By 1978, he moved on to killing, with his wife providing him an alibi. Using jobs that required traveling as a cover, by 1990, Chikatilo claimed to have slain 56 people, mostly in the Rostov Oblast, earning him the moniker the Butcher of Rostov. After being arrested and later confessing to his tirade of crimes, Chikatilo was held in a cage in court. He probably, in some respects, wanted to be caught. I can't imagine somebody doing that for all those many years and not realizing that he was living in a hell of his own creation. He was found guilty and executed in 1994. Ted Bundy. In the 1970s, many women came to the aid of a man, often appearing injured, who needed help in one form or another. With his good looks and charisma, this mystery guy seemed genuine. Instead, he was one of the most infamous killers in history as he forced his victims into his car. The chances he took, it's not just that he went out and committed murder, but he seemed impervious to fear. And from there, the nightmare began. Ted Bundy escaped capture multiple times, continuing his grim spree as he did. But by 1980, he faced court for the final time. Bundy had confessed to slaying 30 women and teenagers across multiple states in the US. However, there's speculation that the true figure could be over 100. For the third and final time in his life, Bundy was sentenced to capital punishment, which took place in 1989. So it ended for Ted Bundy. 10 years, 28 confessions, millions in Florida's legal battle to end his life. Ed Gein. Serving as inspiration for several horror movie villains, such as Buffalo Bill in The Silence of the Lambs and Leatherface in The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Ed Gein was a disturbing killer. Twisted killer was a quiet loner named Ed Gein. Hidden inside the 51-year-old's rural farmhouse was a ghoulish treasure trove. He was raised by an abusive mother that taught him that women were evil. In 1957, one Bernice Warden vanished in Wisconsin. Following a lead, the police arrived at Gein's isolated house and discovered a terrible scene. On top of Warden's body, they found a catalog of items made from human remains. Altogether, there were pieces made from around 40 people. Gein claimed to have grave robbed most of the remains. In 1968, he was deemed fit to stand trial and was found guilty of warden slaying. Gein spent his remaining years in psychiatric hospitals. He was such a little person um, that I found it hard to picture him as the person who'd committed all these homicides. He lived there very peacefully. He never caused any problems. John Wayne Gacy. One pretty common phobia is clowns, and the case of John Wayne Gacy certainly didn't help ease any of those fears. 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy was a popular socialite who spent his weekends dressed as a clown, entertaining children. Gacy regularly performed in a clown persona at parties and events, but behind the scenes, he was a rampant killer of boys and men. In 1978, after suspecting the police were onto him, a paranoid Gacy would confess his crimes to his lawyers. The police had what they needed to search his house, where they would find several remains in his crawl space. 29 bodies buried in that house of his on Summerdale, a crime of horrendous proportions. In the crawl space underneath, bodies covered with lime and encased in plastic. 
he was charged with the assassination of 33 young men and would spend 14 years on death row before being executed by lethal injection. It was a circus. We were in a room at some point and we saw a television screen and we saw thousands of people lined up at least a mile down the street at the prison with signs, kill the clown, kill Gacy. Fred and Rosemary West. Occasionally, serial killers come in pairs. You're talking about two people who literally would plumb the depths of human depravity. While Fred had murdered in the past before meeting Rosemary Letts, Rose's first victim was purportedly Fred's stepdaughter. The two then went on a rampage, assaulting and killing nine other people together, including West's first wife, Catherine Costello, and their daughter, Heather West. Many of the bodies were buried on their properties. Even though they were not alive, he wants access. He wants to feel that he can actually be part of uh, this area, and they are part of this area. This is his private graveyard. After investigating assault charges against the couple, the police found evidence of the violence. Although officially charged with 12 killings altogether, that number is estimated to be higher. In 1995, before his trial, West took his own life, and Letts was sentenced to life in prison. And I was absolutely gutted. I wanted him to pay the proper price. And he just, like, took his own way out and had his own way about what happened to him. He was in control right to the end. Jeffrey Dahmer. From his late teens, Jeffrey Dahmer began a horrific killing spree. His victims were all men or boys, and many of his later crimes involved unspeakable acts to the bodies. Jeffrey Dahmer was responsible for killing more than a dozen people. The majority of those murders happened in an apartment near the Marquette campus. In 1991, Dahmer enticed Tracy Edwards back to his apartment with the promise of beer and payment for photographs. However, Edwards realized something was wrong and managed to escape. After he flagged down police officers, Dahmer's apartment was investigated and grim evidence was found, leading to Dahmer's arrest. His macabre 13-year crime spree finally ended when this man, Tracy Edwards, brought the police to the infamous apartment. Like the others, he had gone there with the promise of money. He was listening to my heart because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. He was convicted of 15 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. However, in 1994, he was fatally attacked by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver. There were a number of people who felt that Jeffrey Dahmer got exactly what he deserved. And I called his mother. She said, well, now everybody got what they want. The monster is dead. And then she said, he was my son. He was my boy. Albert Fish. Nearly 100 years ago, New York had a killer on the loose nicknamed many things, including the Gray Man and even the Boogeyman. Honestly, it's not too far off. Albert Fish was a disturbed individual who targeted children. While we can't exactly list off the crimes toward them, just know they're terrible. To make things even more disturbing, the unhinged Fish sent the mother of one of his victims a letter describing what he did. Ten years after Fish began his acts, he was captured in 1934 after witnesses claimed to have seen him with missing children. Fish would admit to the murders, but would also claim he had over 100 victims. At his trial the following year, he was sentenced to execution, which was carried out in 1936. H. H. Holmes Thought of as one of the U.S.'s first serial killers, Herman Webster Mudgett, better known as H. H. Holmes, dabbled in fraud in his early years to earn cash. Then he constructed what would be nicknamed the Murder Castle in Chicago, Illinois. It contained secret passageways and trap doors that allowed Holmes to slay privately and dispose of the evidence in the basement's furnace. But what Holmes has done is to create really a killing machine, a factory. He would usually entice women into the building and later opened it up like a hotel. In 1894, Holmes was arrested for a different crime before his killing was discovered. He confessed to 27 victims, but loftier speculations have the number over 200. In 1896, Holmes was executed for his grim crimes. You are cleansed and delivered. May God have mercy on your soul. As Holmes waits for his life to come to an end, he remains cool and composed. Samuel Little. In 2019, the FBI confirmed that they'd identified Samuel Little as the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. After being convicted for slaying three people in 2014, the unsettling extent of his crimes began to leak out over the next few years. 
By 2018, Little had confessed to killing 93 women across the country. It's disturbing to listen to, but investigators want to hear it all and more. 79-year-old Samuel Little has confessed to 93 murders. That's more than were committed by Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer combined. Little provided the FBI with details on many of the cases from 1970 to 2005 and even drew the victims from memory to prove he was telling the truth. These are the portraits drawn by Samuel Little himself to the women he claims to have killed. They're so accurate that family members have recognized lost loved ones from them. Before he passed away in 2020, more than 60 of Little's confessions across at least 14 states had been confirmed by the authorities. Harold Shipman. Doctors are meant to be people we all trust. This makes the case of Harold Shipman especially chilling. He was a general practitioner in England who took people under his care only to end their lives. Five of the 15 women he's been convicted of murdering died in his surgery. Normally, doctors have no such deaths. He signed 70% of his death certificates. Normally, it's no more than 30%. In 1998, one of his patients suddenly passed away, and a will, one that the family knew nothing about, gifted a lot of cash to Shipman. Police investigated the doctor and found evidence of forgery. He falsified computerized medical records. He entered false information on his victims' death certificates and lied to their families. Upon further examination, they found that many of his patients seemed to pass from overdoses of diamorphine. In 1999, Shipman was charged with the murder of 15 patients, many of whom were older women. He was sentenced to life in prison, and in the aftermath, there were thought to be as many as 250 victims. Now he's taken his own life. He was found in his prison cell at 6.20 a.m. Pedro Lopez. What's worse than a serial killer? Well, how about a known one authorities can't currently locate? Born in Colombia, Pedro Lopez was a serial murderer across South America and was nicknamed the Monster of the Andes. It seemed impossible that one man could have carried out so much violence. If Lopez was telling the truth, he'd rank among the most prolific serial killers in history. In 1980, after attempting to abduct someone, Lopez was arrested in Ecuador. He was soon charged with 110 homicides. However, Lopez reportedly confessed that his victims could total more than 300. Lopez, it seemed, hoped to gain a twisted kind of immortality. <laughs> In 2006, the Guinness World Records actually named him the most prolific serial killer before it was taken down in bad taste. Unfortunately, Lopez was released for good behavior in 1998 and was declared sane. But as of 2002, after being linked to another murder, his whereabouts are unknown. He went back into the countryside he knew so well, to the killing ground where he had found so many victims. That was the last time anyone reported seeing Pedro Alonso Lopez. Our next list will be highlighting some notorious European predators who terrorized the lives of so many people. They had not dealt with anyone of his caliber before. Welcome to Watch Mojo. Now today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most notorious European serial killers. I feel absolutely no pity for any of those people I killed. I am a much better person than any of them. For this list, we'll be looking at infamous murderers in European countries. Who do you think is the most notorious? Number 10, Anatoly Onoprienko, AKA the Beast of Ukraine. Ukraine. The terrified locals have come to call him the Terminator. Though most widely known as the Beast of Ukraine, Onoprienko was also called the Terminator and Citizen O. After his arrest in 1966, he admitted to killing 52, dating back to 1989. This man's from the devil. He was motivated by evil, and that's, that's what drove him. He targeted families, as well as any potential witnesses. Police found a slew of evidence in his home, including weapons and items he stole from his victims. He's gone on record saying he felt no remorse for his crimes. I feel like a cross between a human and a robot. Most of my work was supposed to be done by robots. I consider myself an experimenter with myself and with other people. While in prison, 
Onoprienko issued a press release saying that his goal was to achieve a world record for killing. Life has treated me harshly, so I don't think about being punished. I'm a working man. I'm an executioner. And remember, punishment is up to the gods or the devil, and I don't think about it. In 2013, he died of a heart attack at the age of 54. Number 9. Karl Denka, a.k.a. the Forgotten Cannibal, the Cannibal of Jambitsa. Prussia. Church organist Karl Denka appeared to be a kind, well-liked, upstanding member of the community. What people didn't know was that he killed at least 42 homeless and or traveling people over the course of 21 years. As the nickname suggests, he consumed his victims, but he didn't keep the remains all to himself. He owned a food shop selling meats, the ingredients of which we don't want to think about. Denka was finally caught in 1924. However, he took his own life before he could be questioned or convicted. Upon searching his residence, police found many various body parts. Number 8. Henri Desiré Landru, aka the Bluebeard of Gambia, France. This unassuming Parisian swindler seduced and killed woman during World War I. Also referred to as France's lonely heart serial killer, he took advantage of wealthy wives left widowed by their husbands dying in the war and placed dating ads in newspapers. Despite being a husband and a father, Landru was romantically involved with almost 300 women. Though no bodies were ever found, he was found guilty of 11 murders. It's believed that he murdered over 70 more women. In February 1922, he was executed by guillotine. Number 7. Mikhail Popkov, a.k.a. The Werewolf, Russia Ex-policeman Mikhail Popkov used his occupation to lure his victims, offering them late-night car rides. He admitted to targeting women he saw as immoral, killing them for going out partying. One of the survivors, who was 17 at the time, said she was violently attacked and left for dead. Since his arrest in 2012, Popkov has confessed to killing over 80, all women except for one policeman. However, these are just the murders he can remember. He's widely regarded as Russia's worst serial killer and reportedly brags to his cellmate that he'd killed more people than Andrei Chikatilo. Number 6. Mariam Solokiotis, aka the woman Rasputin, the killer nun, Greece. Mother Superior Mariam Solakiotis was a nun who embezzled the dowries of wealthy women joining the covenant. The abbess allegedly killed 177 men and women at the Karatea convent. She led the Old Kalendaris sect, which is separate from the Greek Orthodox Church for its practices. Solakiotis strictly imposed abstinence and fasting among the members of the convent, leading to many deaths, both youths and adults alike. Police arrested the nun for her shocking crimes in 1951. She received life in prison in 1952, dying two years later. Number 5. Alexander Pachuskin, aka the Chessboard Killer, Russia. Pachuskin's crimes went uninvestigated until the body of a retired police officer was discovered in 2005. He also killed a co worker who left a note for her parents naming him as the person she'd be with. A metro ticket was found on her body, and police saw Pichuskin on the station's surveillance footage. These are the last images of Marina Moskalyova alive. She doesn't know it, but she's walking with a man who has a hammer in his bag and who fully intends to kill her. That man is Alexander Pichushkin. Eager for recognition, he made a full confession to the media. After his arrest in June 2006, police found a chessboard with 62 spots filled, leaving two spots open. He was also called the Bitsa Park Maniac due to his frequent victims left in Moscow's Bitsaveski, aka Bitsa Park. Number 4. Nils Hugel, Germany As a nurse, Hugel deliberately put his patients into cardiac arrest in order to save them in front of his colleagues, but many did not survive. Colleagues called him the resuscitation Rambo because he would manhandle them out of the way so he could get to the sick.
but a high death rate among his patients made colleagues suspicious. Over his 15 years of employment at two hospitals in northern Germany, it's suspected that Hugel killed as many as 300 patients, a third of which he confessed to. In 2005, Hugel was finally caught red-handed as he was about to administer an injection to a patient. It was the end of a killing spree, unprecedented in Germany. A nurse who doesn't help sick people, but secretly murders them. In 2018, he was found guilty of 85 of them, while he was already serving a life sentence for two he caused by lethal injection. He's regarded as Germany's worst serial killer in modern history. Number three, Elizabeth Bathory, AKA the Blood Countess, Hungary. The legendary Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Etched is labeled by the Guinness World Record as the most prolific female serial killer in history. The story goes that she killed virgin females, believing that bathing in their blood made her appear young. Her sadistic reputation was beginning to strike fear into the hearts of all who heard her name. You must imagine these people cowering outside the walls of her castle, never knowing what exactly is going on in there, but knowing at the same time that they are absolutely subject to this person's power, to this person's whim. She's been called a vampire and a cannibal. Though the lore that surrounds her is mostly speculated, we do know that she was essentially put on house arrest until she died. She and several of her servants were found guilty of imprisoning and murdering over 600 females. In this case, the truth is much more horrific than fiction. Number two, Peter Sutcliffe, AKA the Yorkshire Ripper, England. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, Sutcliffe murdered 13 women and attempted to murder seven. It was an investigation with twists and turns and a case that still haunts the British public to this day. For years, women and girls felt that simply leaving their homes at night meant taking their lives in their hands. Since most of the victims were sex workers, few were concerned about their deaths and officials didn't bother investigating. However, the public was outraged when a teen's body was found at a playground in 1977. Due to her age, she was deemed the first innocent since she didn't lead the same lifestyle as the previous victims. All uh, women then felt uh, at risk and very positively it had been established that the same man was responsible for all these uh, killings. and. Uh, it had developed by this point into a reign of terror, really. Sutcliffe was dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper because of the similarities between the injuries on his victims and that of Jack the Ripper. Despite being interviewed by police several times, Sutcliffe wasn't caught until 1981. You can imagine how I felt. I was absolutely stunned. I was totally gutted because I remembered interviewing the man, I remembered my suspicions, my colleagues' suspicions, and what we'd written about him. And I thought, what might have been? Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few dishonorable mentions. Harold Shipman, AKA Dr. Death, England, Britain's most prolific mass murderer. I think that a significant number of the people that Dr. Shipman killed, he may have killed quite simply because he did not wish to continue caring for them for whatever reason. Michel Fournurai, aka Ogre of the Ardennes, France and Belgium, hunted women with his wife. Fournurai's crimes are amongst the worst France has ever suffered. He's killed at least eight young girls and women but it's likely to be more. Andrei Chikatilo, AKA the Butcher of Rostov, Russia, killed over 50 women and minors. Whether you believe that he was the victim of the circumstances under which he was born, or whether you believe he was an evil person who used free will to do what he did and wanted to kill, um, that evil that grew in him is not something that's alien to all of us. Monster of Florence, Italy. Italy's unidentified son of Sam. The people of Florence are losing patience. They are angry, scared, and frustrated with an investigation that has failed to trap the killer. Number one, Jack the Ripper, England. 
Arguably the most infamous serial killer of all time, Jack the Ripper was the elusive perpetrator behind the Whitechapel murders in the late 1800s. The number of victims is still unknown, though five were identified, known as the Canonical Five. The murders shocked the Victorian world with their brutality and the world's most famous serial killer came into being. The unidentified serial killer was believed to have a medical background given the surgical precision used to remove his victim's organs from their bodies. I am once again reminded that a cunning psychopath armed with surgical knowledge and a razor-sharp scalpel can tear a human life apart in a very short time indeed. Some body parts were taken and others were left at the crime scenes, but a number of these remains were sent to police along with taunting letters. As a consequence, the murders are now turned almost into a street pantomime, and five sordid East End murders became an international phenomenon, and the unknown miscreant responsible for those murders was elevated to the realm of legend. Theories about his identity continue to circulate to this day. Okay, we're now going to look into the twisted minds of serial killers connected to other serial killers. Arguably the most prolific serial killer the United States has ever seen, outranking even Bundy. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at serial killers who share some sort of surprising connection. Whether they've associated with, copied, or even targeted each other, there are eerie links to investigate. He watches a documentary on the San Francisco Zodiac Killer. Dennis Rader and Dana Sue Gray communicated. The BTK killer was an urban legend for evading authorities during his activities in Kansas between the 1970s and 90s. Finally, in 2005, Dennis Rader was sentenced to life imprisonment for 10 murders. There's no way that I can ever repay him. Among the many who wrote to him afterwards was a writer for Psychology Today, who received a forwarded prison postcard from Dana Sue Gray. The former nurse killed and robbed three elderly women before a failed homicide attempt led to her arrest in 1994. All Greco says is, I think you know what this is about. Dana is then handcuffed and taken to a waiting police car. Though Gray claimed to only have financial motivations for killing, her correspondence with BTK revealed a genuine admiration for a fellow murderer. She's reportedly reached out to other criminals. Disturbingly, Raider just boasted about having a higher body count than Gray. He, he just evil, evil personified. Edmund Kemper and Herbert Mullen, investigation interacted. I'm an American and I went off the deep end. Since 1973, Edmund Kemper has been one of the most infamous inmates at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. Many other serial killers have resided there with him, but Kemper has a unique history with Herbert Mullen. Each man's police investigation was compromised by their being active around the same area and time. They were finally captured two months apart, then became neighbors again at CMF. Kemper has claimed that he was previously aware of and had encounters with Mullen for years. They reportedly interacted more in prison, but mostly with hostility. Kemper nevertheless acknowledged finding a kindred spirit in his competitor. Mullen ultimately died at the California Healthcare Facility in Stockton in 2022. Herbert Mullen died of natural causes. Pedro Rodriguez Filho and Francisco de Assis Pereira, targeted. One of Brazil's most notorious murderers is best known for his connection to a fictional serial killer. Pedro Rodriguez Filho's primarily targeting suspected criminals inspired Jeff Lindsay to create the vigilante Dexter Morgan. After leaving prison in 2007, Pedrinho Matador publicly expressed remorse for the many lives he took or planned to take. Among his targets, he claimed in an interview, was Francisco de Assis Pereira. Um Maniaco do Parque shocked Brazil when he confessed to 11 sexual assaults and murders in 1998. He epitomized what Filio stood against and even survived a prison riot in 2000. While it's uncertain if Filio had a shot at Pereira, he maintained that meeting such violence with violence is senseless. In 2023, Filio was murdered by multiple unidentified assailants. Rodney Alcala and Richard Cottingham, co-workers. Rodney Alcala will go down in history as one of the world's most evil killers. Rodney Alcala and Richard Cottingham were two of New York's biggest serial killers in the 1970s. While it's not too surprising that they crossed paths, they did so daily. 
In 71, Alcala found work at an office of the health insurance company Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, where Cottingham worked as a computer operator. He worked in what they refer to as Midtown Manhattan, right in the heart of the uh, business district, the Blue Cross Blue Shield. He was still working there when he was apprehended in 1980. Alcala, however, hopped jobs throughout the East and West Coasts, earning the nickname The Dating Game Killer for his appearance on the eponymous California-based game show. The detective frantically tried to call the police department and let other detectives know that he was on television. He and the torso killer later claimed that they never interacted while working for BCBS. The coincidence nonetheless reflects the scale of New York's serial killing crisis at the time. Jack the Ripper and Peter Sutcliffe, possible copycat. In the more than 130 years since Jack the Ripper terrorized London, he has never been officially identified. The only name linked with the Whitechapel murders, the strange character who prowls about after midnight. But in the 1970s, he seemed to be active again in West Yorkshire. Peter Sutcliffe was ultimately convicted of killing 13 women, many of them sex workers. This profession was targeted by the Ripper and still attracts many serial killers. Though Sutcliffe didn't claim to be a copycat, his M.O. earned him the nickname the Yorkshire Ripper. Moreover, John Humble of Wearside infamously disrupted the police investigation by submitting a false confession signed Jack the Ripper. The author signed himself Jack the Ripper. Whatever Sutcliffe's objective was, his legacy is entangled with one of England's most fabled criminals. The Yorkshire Ripper, in fact, claimed more lives than his namesake. Sutcliffe knew he was caught, and it was then he said, I know what you're leading up to. It's me, I'm the Ripper. Kenneth Bianchi and Richard Ramirez, jail cell. The Hillside Strangler shook Los Angeles well before the killer was revealed to actually be two people. Bono and Bianchi would move in together and become partners in crime. It's believed that cousins Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono Jr. partly inspired Richard Ramirez's killing spree. In any case, the Night Stalker found an unsettling upside to his arrest in 1985. According to the 2021 docuseries Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, Ramirez was elated to be placed in the same jail cell that held Bianchi after his own arrest. I said, we're going to put you in the same cell as a hillside strangler. With LA's long history of serial killers, two were likely to occupy the same space at a police station. But Ramirez's enthusiasm for his fellow killers and this coincidence distinguishes it as another indictment of his warped psyche. And that's where we left him. We left him in, in Kenneth Bianchi's old cell. John Wayne Gacy and Robin Gett, employee. Besides his enterprises of Pogo the Clown and sadistic homicide, John Wayne Gacy ran the Chicagoland construction business PDM Contractors. By June 1971, Gacy had saved enough money to start his own contracting company. He called it PDM. Some of his victims worked for him. Years into his prison sentence, Gacy began insisting that most of the 33 murders behind his death penalty were committed by employees. Hell, if you could see my schedule, my work schedule, you know damn well that I was never out there. The only real substance to this far-fetched claim was Robin Gecht. The handyman led his own group, the Ripper Crew, who murdered 18 women in occult rituals during the 1980s. Investigation discovery found evidence that Gecht did work for Gacy, but none that they collaborated on anything other than contract work. Whatever influence both men might have had on each other, their unspeakable crimes were made worse by their organizational skills. He loved the idea that he could um, tell people, this is what I want you to do, I'm the boss. The Zodiac Killer and Eddie Seda, copycat. The serial killer known as Zodiac has been mythologized due to his never being captured. But the shocking truth is that Toski very nearly did capture the Zodiac, as one of his letters reveal. Thankfully, Heriberto Eddie Seda was. He targeted people based on their Zodiac signs and sent coded letters to police and media. Seda had attacked nine people, killing three by the time he was apprehended in 1996. His age alone ruled out the theory that the so-called New York Zodiac Killer was the same person who murdered five in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 60s. Seda was just an admirer, that rare example of a copycat who attained his own status as a serial killer. Somewhere in that developing psyche, he thinks, perhaps I could become the Zodiac Killer. He is now serving 232 years in prison, while the original Zodiac Killer remains officially unidentified. 
The FBI released a statement saying the Zodiac Killer case remains an ongoing investigation for the FBI San Francisco Division. Otis Tool and Jeffrey Dahmer, investigation. Otis Tool claimed to commit hundreds more murders than the six he was convicted on. He most notably confessed to, but was not formally charged with killing the six-year-old son of America's most wanted host, John Walsh. In 2007, it was publicly revealed that police also looked into another Florida-based suspected serial killer. Jeffrey Dahmer was in the same mall on the same day Adam Walsh was abducted from a Sears department store. It was the middle of the day, yet no one really saw much of anything. Some even theorized that he and Toole collaborated on the crime. The official record is that Henry Lee Lucas was Toole's only partner. Still, with so much overlap between his and Dahmer's profile and methods, their paths crossing is its own loaded true crime subject. Without a confession and physical evidence linking him to the crime, Toole was never charged with Adam's murder. Ted Bundy and Gary Ridgway, profiled. Gary Ridgway is probably the most prolific serial killer in America, if not, if not the world. In the years leading up to his execution, Ted Bundy became an asset in understanding the nature of serial killers. He especially helped in understanding the nature of one in particular. In 1984, Bundy offered to assist a task force pursuing Washington State's Green River Killer. His prison interviews provided insight into the mindset and behavioral patterns unique to his psychopathology. But Gary Ridgway would not be apprehended until 2001, 12 years after Bundy's execution. It wasn't until 2001 we got a positive hit on him. DNA profiling ultimately brought him down, but many of Bundy's predictions of his character were uncanny. His own psychological profiling is a notable example of how terrible minds think alike. According to interviewer Dave Reichert, however, Bundy was likely just jealous of Ridgway's twisted fame. I can't begin to understand. What are some other remarkable connections between notorious criminals? Who believed he was following in the footsteps of the notorious Zodiac Killer. When you think of nurses, you likely think of individuals who provide care and protection. Well, these upcoming nurses, they turn to murder. Graham got life without parole. Wood has served 29 years of her 20 to 40 year sentence. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're discussing 10 serial killer nurses. We also believe that she kept hold of the parcels for a while until the bodies decomposed. For this list, we're looking at the most notorious nurses known for being angels of death. Have you heard any of these medical horror stories? Beverly Allett. For nearly two months in early 1991, young nurse Beverly Allett intentionally harmed 13 patients in the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire, England. Four of those attacks were ultimately fatal, while nine survived but were left seriously injured. A chilling pattern had emerged from the collapse of 13 children, four of whom had died. Many of the cases were the result of insulin overdoses. Allett came under suspicion after the death of infant Claire Peck on April 22, 1991. After she was apprehended, medical experts believed Allett suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is when an individual creates false symptoms in somebody else, usually somebody that they're having, uh, that they're in charge of. In May 1993, Allett received 13 life sentences for multiple charges, including murder, attempted murder, and causing grievous bodily harm. Due to her mental illness, she served her time at Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire. Even after sentence when she was seen at Rampton Hospital, not once has she ever expressed any remorse for what she's done. Lucy Letby. As of writing, Lucy Letby's trial is ongoing. However, the notoriety of her alleged crimes warranted inclusion. In the mid-2010s, the neonatal intensive care unit at England's Countess of Chester Hospital had an alarming increase in infant deaths. During the years-long investigations, nurse Lucy Letby, whose work schedule coincided with the many fatalities, was arrested as a murder suspect and eventually charged with eight counts of murder and another 10 counts of attempted murder. Today, she appeared before a judge charged with the murders of eight babies. She's accused of injecting the infants with insulin and with air. When police searched her home, they found a note allegedly written by Letby saying, quote, I killed them on purpose, and quote, I am evil, I did this. She has entered a plea of not guilty. I am evil, I did this. Kristen Gilbert. 
Kristen Gilbert began working as a nurse at Northampton's Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Massachusetts in 1989. During her seven years of employment, the hospital's death rate tripled. Kristen Gilbert murders her patients using the ultimate cover, her gender and her profession. In 1996, three other nurses reported their suspicions about Gilbert, prompting an investigation. She allegedly injected high doses of epinephrine, or adrenaline, into patients' IVs, which caused cardiac arrest. It's speculated that Gilbert orchestrated emergencies seeking attention from her boyfriend, hospital police officer James Perrault. And there was one person Kristen wanted to impress more than anyone, her lover. In 1998, she was sentenced to 15 months in prison for calling in a false bomb threat to the hospital. Then in March 2001, she was found guilty of four murders and two attempted murders and sentenced to consecutive life terms with an additional 20 years. Prosecutors believe her motive is ego. Richard Angelo. For seven months, Richard Angelo worked the overnight shift in the special care unit at Good Samaritan Medical Center in New York. Though he was well-liked at the hospital, Angelo felt inadequate and he put patients' lives in danger just so he could heroically save them in front of his colleagues. But he allowed his own needs to take the lead. He would administer paralytic drugs, Pavilon, and Anectine via IV. But things didn't always go according to plan, and several patients died. He confesses to poisoning dozens of his patients over the course of months. On October 11th, 1987, elderly patient Girolamo Kucic survived one of Angelo's attempts and identified him as the culprit. Angelo, whose lawyers claimed he had dissociative identity disorder, confessed to police, and it was determined that dozens of patients were drugged, with several dying as a result. He was sentenced to 61 years to life. Richard Angelo is found guilty of two counts of murder. The Leinz Angels of Death. In the 1980s, Leinz Hospital in Vienna, Austria, employed four nurses' aides who murdered at least 49 patients, and possibly up to 200. Waltraut Wagner allegedly killed the first victim in 1983. She claimed an elderly patient asked for help in ending her life, and Wagner relished the power it gave her. She enlisted her fellow aides, Irena Leidolf, Maria Gruber, and Stefania Meyer, and they began murdering as a group, usually by administering lethal injections. But they also used Wagner's water cure, pouring water into a patient's throat with their nose pinched closed. The four killers were given sentences ranging from 15 years to life imprisonment. By 2008, all four had been released, Wagner and Leidolf for good behavior. Orville Lynn Majors. Licensed practical nurse Orville Lynn Majors was a favorite among patients at Indiana's Vermilion County Hospital. But suspicions arose when the hospital estimated that they had one death every day while Majors was on duty, but averaged one every 23 days when he wasn't. In March 1995, Majors was suspended from VCH, and that December, the state nursing board revoked his license. But it would be another two years before he was arrested for killing patients with lethal potassium chloride injections. Majors' co-worker and former roommate Andy Harris testified that he said old patients, quote, should be gassed. Investigators had gathered enough evidence to arrest Orville Lynn Majors on suspicion of murder. Though he's suspected of up to 130 murders, Majors was charged with seven and ultimately convicted of six, earning him 360 years in prison. The investigation took nearly four years, but in the end, it paid off. Orville Lynn Majors was convicted and sentenced to 360 years in prison. Jane Topin. Jane Topin, America's most prolific female serial killer, killed just to see the life drain out of her victim's eyes. Jane Topin, born Honora Kelly, began as a nurse trainee in 1885 at Cambridge Hospital in Massachusetts, where she was given the name Jolly Jane for her pleasant demeanor. Soon, she started experimenting with morphine and atrophine, using her patients as test subjects. It was here she learned the skills to become an angel of death as she moved effortlessly among the middle and upper classes. Topin continued as a nurse at Massachusetts General Hospital before she was fired for overdosing patients. She then became a private nurse and went on a spree, killing a dozen patients, including her landlord and his wife and her own foster sister. 
She remained largely undetected until she murdered an entire family in less than two months. She was finally brought to justice in 1901 after she killed off the entire Davis family of Catamet, Massachusetts. Topin was arrested in October 1901 and eventually confessed to 31 murders, claiming to have felt a sexual thrill from the experience. Deemed not guilty by reason of insanity, she spent the rest of her days at Taunton State Hospital. Topan was found not guilty by reason of insanity and spent the rest of her life in a mental hospital. Janine Jones. In October 1978, Janine Jones, a licensed vocational nurse, began working in the pediatric intensive care unit of San Antonio's Bear County Hospital. Staff noticed an increase in infant mortality during her shifts which dropped after she left in March 1982. We just had no evidence of any direct connection with kids dying on Janine Jones's watch. Despite rumors of the nurse's behavior, Jones was hired at a small pediatric clinic in August 1982, and by September, several patients had died. After lengthy investigations, in 1984, Jones was given a 99-year prison sentence for murder, and later another 60 years for almost killing another patient with heparin. It took the jury no time to become completely convinced that she had indeed set out to kill. To keep Jones from being released in 2018, she was charged with the 1981 murder of Joshua Sawyer. In 2020, she accepted a plea deal to drop additional charges and received a life sentence. So she is essentially taking back control by putting in this guilty plea. Charles Cullen. From 1988 to 2003, Charles Cullen murdered as many as 40 patients in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania, though some experts believe the real number is likely in the hundreds. As a nurse, he went from hospital to hospital, nine in total, injecting patients with lethal doses of digoxin, insulin, and epinephrine. When he was fired for stealing medications, he just got another job and continued killing. It was the suspicious death of a Roman Catholic priest named Florian Gall that set in motion the events that would eventually expose Charles Cullen. He wouldn't be arrested until December 2003. His friend and co-worker at Somerset Medical Center, Amy Loughran, wore a wire to help police obtain evidence. He was always early, always on time. In March 2006, he received multiple consecutive life sentences, avoiding the death penalty per his plea agreement. Are you sorry what you did? Yes. Um. Niels Hügel. In 2001, hospital staff at the Oldenburg Clinic in Germany discussed the recent surge in patient deaths and resuscitations, more than half of which occurred when nurse Niels Högel was working. Like other serial killer nurses, Högel put patients in life-threatening situations so he could resuscitate them and be seen as a hero. Prosecutor said that he deliberately induced cardiac arrest in patients so that he could then resuscitate them and impress his colleagues. He was asked to resign a year later, but was given a positive recommendation and continued his methods at Delmenhorst Clinic. In June 2005, he was caught giving a patient the arrhythmia-inducing drug Agmaline. And then on a single weekend on Hügel's shift, there were 14 resuscitations and five deaths. And yet Hügel was simply transferred to another ward. In 2018, Niels Hügel was charged with 100 counts of murder. He only admitted to 43, but was ultimately convicted of 85 and sentenced to life imprisonment. He's suspected of killing roughly 300 patients in all. Still, the legal proceedings have not yet been completed. Fellow nurses, doctors, supervisors, who among them was complicit in Niels Hügel's crimes? The investigations are ongoing. It's now time to discover some truly shocking tales of serial killers who struck again after their release. The general reaction was, how on earth could this man get out? This is the broomstick killer. And um, if anyone should be executed, it should be him. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at the most tragic cases where convicted serial killers were released early from prison, only to prove that leopards truly cannot change their spots. After I admitted to the 11, it was like a big weight fell off. And yeah. then one detective asked me, if you had to do it over again, what would you do? I said, I'd put them all in one hole and you'd never find them. Raymond Eugene Brown. 
on October 1, 1960, Raymond Eugene Brown broke into the house where his aunt, grandmother, and great-grandmother lived, looking to steal money to buy himself shoes. After being caught by his aunt, he fatally stabbed her. Then, to ensure there were no witnesses, he did the same to his grandmother and great-grandmother. Nevertheless, Brown was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. Due to his exemplary behavior behind bars, Brown was granted parole in 1973. However, he soon landed back in prison after sexually assaulting his apartment manager. In 1987, just one year after he was released again, Brown murdered his girlfriend and her daughter in their shared apartment. This time, he was sentenced to death, and he passed away on death row in 2008. Hugo Bustamante Perez. This Chilean killer lived a life of crime that led to multiple stints in prison. His first murder occurred in 1996 when he claimed the lives of Eduardo Paez, a former cellmate, and Paez's mother, Elena Inahosa. Perez evaded justice for these murders and they remained unsolved for years. It wasn't until 2005 when he killed his partner, Veronica Vasquez, and her son that he was handed a 27-year prison sentence. After serving just 11 years, Perez was granted conditional release. He subsequently began a relationship with a woman named Denise Llanos and successfully pulled her into his dark ways. In July 2020, Perez and Llanos conspired to murder Llanos's daughter, Ambar Cornejo. They were both convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Somkid Pumpuang. Between January and June 2005, Somkid Pumpuang unleashed terror across several provinces of Thailand, ending the lives of five women in various hotels. While seemingly leading his intended sixth victim to another hotel, Pumpuang was finally apprehended by police. Although prosecutors initially sought the death penalty, he pleaded guilty to four of the murders, resulting in a life sentence instead. This sentence was further reduced to 13 years, thanks in part to his upstanding behavior behind bars. After his release in May 2019, Pumpuang began dating Rasami Mulichan. But in December, a domestic argument between the two turned physical, and he killed Mulichan before fleeing the scene. He was later arrested on a train and was condemned to death for Mulichan's murder. Mani Ram Singh Back in 2000, India was gripped by a strange murder case. Five people had been blindfolded and killed with a stone in what appeared to be a dark ritual. Police were able to trace the murders to Maniram Sen, who was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. Fast forward to 2020 and an eerily similar murder resurfaced. Adil Wahab had also been killed with a stone. During their investigation, authorities learned that Sen, who was released from prison in 2017, had borrowed money from Wahab. They also discovered that in both cases, Sen had duped the victims with false promises of helping them find a hidden treasure, only to kill them to avoid paying back. He was arrested and charged with Wahab's murder. Yuri Sparihin a lifelong criminal, Yuri Sparihin committed his first murder in 1980, just weeks after being released from prison for theft. As he was still a minor, he was sentenced to only 10 years. Upon his release, he quickly found himself back behind bars for a sexual assault case and for attacking a police officer. He was released again in 2000, but returned soon after for sexually assaulting and killing two girls. This time, Sparihin received a 20-year sentence, and he remained locked up until June 2020. Any attempts at rehabilitation were clearly futile, as Sparihin went on to sexually assault and murder another woman just two months later. Following a heated police chase, he was apprehended and sentenced to life imprisonment. Mena Ramulu Mena Ramulu reportedly developed a hatred for women when his wife jilted him just days after their wedding. From 2003, he began killing women in India, claiming nine lives before his arrest in 2009. Ramulu received a life sentence, but escaped less than a year later and murdered five more women before his rearrest. After he was sent back to prison, Ramulu petitioned a high court, which inexplicably granted his release. During this time, he killed two more women. He was apprehended again, after which he filed another appeal, which resulted in his release yet again. Unsurprisingly, he is now alleged to have murdered two more women while free. Ramulu was arrested once more in 2021 and was charged with the murders. David Edward Maust Born in Pennsylvania in 1954, David Edward Maust had a troubled childhood that led to his admission to a psychiatric hospital at an early age. 
In 1971, he joined the army and was stationed in Germany, where he killed his first victim. Maust claimed this death was accidental, hence he was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to four years in prison. Following his release, he killed another person, resulting in a 35-year sentence. However, due to time served and good behavior, he was released after just 17 years in 1999. He went on to murder three more people and buried their remains in his basement. These crimes earned Maust three life sentences, but he ultimately took his own life in his jail cell. Arthur Shawcross. A couple of hunters that were out in the area, underneath this culvert, they observed a body in the water. When Arthur Shawcross committed his first murder in May 1971, he had already been imprisoned for arson and burglary. His first victim's body wasn't discovered until September, just after he committed a second murder. For these two killings, Shawcross pleaded guilty to manslaughter and served 14 years in prison. Despite psychiatrists labeling him a schizoid psychopath, Shawcross was released on parole in 1987. He then began a murderous spree in Rochester, New York, claiming the lives of 12 women. At the autopsy, around the neck area, they observed bruising, some damage around their throat area, hemorrhaging of the veins in the eyes. So the cause of death, she was strangled to death. Shawcross was arrested in January 1990 and pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, citing brain damage, traumatic childhood experiences, and PTSD from the Vietnam War. Nevertheless, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, where he died of cardiac arrest in 2008. After I admitted to the 11, it was like a big weight fell off me. And then one detective asked me, if you had to do it over again, what would you do? I said, I'd put them all in one hole and you'd never find them. Pedro Lopez. Pedro Lopez is one of history's most prolific serial killers, with at least 110 confirmed victims. His murderous spree began after his 1978 release from prison for car theft. Lopez targeted girls across South America, claiming lives in Ecuador, Peru, and his native Colombia. His crimes might have remained unnoticed if not for a flash flood in Ecuador, which unearthed the remains of several victims. Lopez was arrested shortly after and confessed to 110 murders in Ecuador alone. Despite the magnitude of his crimes, he received a 16-year sentence, the maximum under Ecuadorian law. After serving his time, Lopez was deported to Colombia, where he spent three years in a psychiatric hospital before being released. He then disappeared and is suspected to have continued killing. Kenneth McDuff. The general reaction was, how on earth could this man get out? This is the broomstick killer. And um, if anyone should be executed, it should be him. It had been more than two decades, but many recalled all too well the horrific crimes of Kenneth McDuff. August 6, 1966. 20-year-old Kenneth McDuff was headed to Fort Worth. McDuff had a new friend along for the ride. Although he had reportedly bragged of killing before, Kenneth McDuff was first convicted of murder for the 1966 slayings of Robert Brand, Edna Sullivan, and Mark Dunham. The three teenagers were visiting Texas from California when McDuff and an accomplice abducted and murdered them. For these crimes, McDuff received the death penalty, which was later commuted to a life sentence. And that pact was that in order to relieve prison overcrowding, you're going to turn loose 150 inmates a day. They went through the con artist, you know, eventually worked their way up to the car thieves, but suddenly they had run out of bodies. They found themselves in the dregs of the prison system. The parole board reached Kenneth McDuff in October 1989 and set him free. Afterwards, he hired a lawyer who successfully secured his parole, leading to his release in 1989. It took all of three days for McDuff to give in to his murderous tendencies again. Over the next three years, he killed at least six women before being arrested in May 1992. McDuff was once again sentenced to death and was ultimately executed on November 17, 1998. He said, they'll take away my commissary. They won't treat me right. This is a guy who's going to be executed in two weeks. I mean, it's preposterous anyway, but that's the way he thought. A meeting with officials was arranged. They assured McDuff that he wouldn't lose prison privileges, and he began talking. He began telling us with great detail 
did we miss any other recidivist serial killers? Kenneth McDuff will be remembered as the evil earthquake that shook the foundation of the prison system and the parole system to its base. And out of it, the most sweeping changes in the history of Texas have come. And how ironic that such good came from such evil. Let's face it, two serial killers working together is an absolutely terrifying thought. But as we're about to see, it's happened more times than you might think. While in prison, Faye wrote a letter to her husband assuring him that things would cool down soon. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at the deadliest duos, be they romantic couples, blood relatives, or simply friends, who spread terror in their corners of the world and together claimed multiple lives. I really don't think that she was the killer herself. She was just a participant. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. No one suspected it was the attractive young couple next door, who, with three killings behind them, were beginning to unravel. Infamously known as the Ken and Barbie killers, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka first met in 1987 and instantly fell in love. That same year, Bernardo began committing a series of sexual assaults in Ontario, Canada, which eventually escalated to murder. Together, he and Homolka sexually assaulted and murdered at least three girls, including Homolka's sister Tammy. They were finally arrested in 1993, at which point Homolka turned on Bernardo, claiming she had been coerced into participating in the crimes under threat of violence. Because he knows Carla Homolka has gone to the police, he understands that the net is closing in on him. She struck a deal with prosecutors, pleading guilty to manslaughter, and received a 12-year prison sentence. Bernardo, on the other hand, was convicted of multiple crimes, including first-degree murder and sexual assault, and was sentenced to life in prison. Probably the most sinister irony of this case is the fact that the Mahaffey body was found on the day Bernardo and Homolka were married. Amelia Sack and Annie Walters. In the late 1800s, British midwife Amelia Sack ran a nursing home in London, employing a nurse named Annie Walters. Together, they became involved in baby farming, offering new mothers, most of whom were servants, a place to recover after giving birth and charging them a fee to have their unwanted children adopted. However, instead of finding new homes for these children, Sack and Walters sent them to an early grave, either by poisoning or strangulation. Their deadly collaboration ultimately claimed the lives of over a dozen children. The two were arrested after Walter's landlord, a police officer, grew suspicious when she brought one of her victims home. They were convicted of the murders and executed by hanging. Leonard Lake and Charles Ng. He then confessed that his name was really Leonard Lake. Lake told police that the Asian man they were looking for was named Charles Ng. These two ex-Marines first met in the early 1980s and began their killing spree shortly after. They committed their crimes at a cabin Leonard Lake owned in California, primarily targeting women, but sometimes wiping out entire families. In total, they were responsible for up to 25 murders. Their reign of terror ended in 1985 when they both visited a hardware store and Charles Ng was caught shoplifting. Forensic specialists dusted for fingerprints and latent evidence. They hoped that if Lake had indeed kept a prisoner here, he or she had left behind some clue of their presence. While Ng escaped on foot before police arrived, Lake was apprehended, but he ended his own life by swallowing a cyanide pill. Police later searched the cabin and unearthed the remains of their victims. It took weeks before authorities found Ng in Canada. He was extradited to the U.S. and sentenced to death for 11 murders. Their strategy was to resurrect Ng's dead accomplice, Leonard Lake, and lay the blame on him. Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. These two fellows met in prison in the California Men's Colony East facility in San Luis Obispo. While incarcerated in the San Luis Obispo Men's Colony prison for various violent crimes, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris developed a deadly friendship. They bonded over their shared interest in sadism and discussed plans to act out their violent fantasies once released. In 1979, after regaining their freedom, they acted on those plans, kidnapping, sexually assaulting, and murdering at least five victims that year. And we came to kind of the critical point, and Roy wondered about, do we, do we have to kill her? Can we just let her go? So I asked him the kind of the critical question, okay? She's been with us a couple hours. They might have claimed many more lives had Norris not discussed the murders with another former inmate, who then reported them to the police. 
Norris eventually testified against Bitteker, securing a life sentence instead of the death penalty. Bitteker was, however, convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Both men died of natural causes in prison. In February 1981, Lawrence Bitteker was sentenced to death. The following month, Roy Norris received a sentence of 45 years to life. Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate. Charlie ransacks the place in search of guns and money. Carol remembers sitting in the kitchen eating cookies and jello from Meyer's refrigerator, telling Charlie, let's go, I'm scared. Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate began dating in 1956 after being introduced by Fugate's sister. Starkweather committed his first murder in November 1957, but it wasn't until two months later that he killed with Fugate's involvement. When he visited her house, Fugate's mother and stepfather asked him to leave. In response, he killed them and her younger sister. Following this, the two lovers embarked on a week-long killing spree, traveling from Nebraska to Wyoming and taking at least seven more lives. Thinking there's been an accident, a geologist named Joe Sprinkle stops to help. Now he wrestles with Starkweather over a rifle and his life. Upon their arrest, they turned on each other. Fugate claimed she was being held hostage, while Starkweather insisted she was a willing participant. Ultimately, Starkweather was executed and Fugate received a life sentence, though she was paroled after serving 18 years. Ward wants Fugate to be pardoned. She says there's no evidence Fugate participated in the murders, instead calling her the victim of the fear and anger of the time. Ray and Faye Copeland. Prosecutors build their case around the theory Ray pulled the trigger and Faye helped organize and cover up his crimes. They decide early on to split the trials. 69-year-old Faye Copeland will be tried first. Ray Copeland began his life of crime by forging checks. After marrying Faye Wilson in 1940, Ray remained fraudulent, hiring drifters to buy cattle with forged checks, no, only to swiftly sell off the cattle and fire the farmhands to avoid being traced. Eventually, police uncovered the scam and sent him to jail. Upon his release, Ray devised a more sinister plan to ensure the drifters couldn't be found. Initially, the charges are conspiracy to commit theft, in reference to Murphy and Warner's fraudulent checks. Together with Faye, he murdered at least five employees. Their crimes went undetected until one man reported to the police that Ray tried to kill him and that he had seen human remains on their farm. The Copelands were both convicted of murder and sentenced to death, although Faye's sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Every time he'd get arrested, he would call me to come and bail him out. I bailed him out of jail quite a few times. About every 18 months seemed like his police out there and him being gone for a while. Uh, it was common for us as growing up. But Ray appeared to have settled down because there had been no arrests in the 20 years since and he had never been arrested for any violent crime. Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood. Wood and Gwendolyn Graham were nurses' aides at Alpine Manor Nursing Home in 1987 when they killed at least five elderly patients. In the 1980s, Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood were nurses' aides at a Michigan nursing home where they became romantically involved. By January 1987, they committed their first murder together, smothering an elderly patient who had Alzheimer's disease. This was the first of five murders they would carry out in the nursing home over a span of weeks. The crimes were eventually discovered in 1988 after the two lovers split up when Wood confessed to her ex-husband. She ultimately cooperated with authorities, claiming Graham was the mastermind while she only acted as a lookout. Although this account has been disputed, Wood served prison time for second-degree murder and was released in 2020. Graham, however, was convicted of first-degree murder and received five life sentences. We have heard from attorneys, her victims' families, and Wood herself. But what about Wood's partner, the woman in prison for life for suffocating five patients? Delfina and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez. Born in Jalisco, Mexico, Delfina and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez became known for running several brothels across the country. But what many did not know was that they killed some of their workers and customers and buried their remains on the property. Their mysterious spree came to an end when police arrested one of their recruiters, who gave them up. A search of their property revealed the remains of 91 men and women, although it's believed their total victim count could exceed 200, ranking them among the most prolific murderers in history. Both sisters received received the maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. While Delfina died in an accident during her sentence, Maria completed her term and essentially vanished after her release. Fred and Rose West. It's horrible to think that there are 
you know, dead bodies in a garden just down the road. It's, it's just thoroughly disgusting. I mean, it's, it's horrifying to think. Totally shocking, especially around, you know, in Gloucester. I mean, you wouldn't expect this to happen. After separating from his first wife, Catherine, Fred West began seeing Rosemary Letts, whom he married in 1972 following Catherine's mysterious death. During their marriage, Fred and Rose lured several women to their house, often under the pretense of offering lodging. Once there, they would sexually assault and murder them, then bury their remains on the property. Detectives believe the solution to an eight-year mystery may be buried in the back garden of this terraced house in Gloucester. It belongs to a couple whose daughter vanished in 1986, but no one ever reported that Heather West had disappeared, and this is proving an obstacle to the investigation. A local reporter had, had got to the scene and, and had shouted out, what's happened to your daughter Heather? And there was an unusual response to that by Fred West, and it wasn't, I don't know, or I'm as concerned as anyone else. What he said was an answer which wasn't to the question. He said, I haven't murdered my daughter. Among their victims were their own daughter, Heather, and Fred's stepdaughter, Charmaine. It's believed that Fred was also responsible for Catherine's death. In 1994, police visited the West's home in Gloucester, England to investigate Heather's disappearance, but discovered several human remains. In 1995, after their arrest, Fred took his own life in prison, while Rose was convicted of 10 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. After the application had been submitted, she said, I don't want to come out of prison, I'd rather stay in prison. Um, and, I, and for the sake of her family and for the sake of herself, and she said she saw herself as making a, a life in prison. Well, people can always change their minds, you know, and I, I said that to her. But I, I also said, well, does that mean you're admitting all of this? And she said, no, I'm not. Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole. Tastes like real meat when it's got barbecue sauce. <laughs> the gruesome claims, the sheer volume of confessions made for stunning headlines, but the outrageousness of the claims left some with doubts. This notorious serial killer duo met at a soup kitchen in 1976 and began working together. They traveled across multiple states committing random murders, primarily targeting hitchhikers and drifters. One of their supposed victims was Adam Walsh, a high-profile murder that drew national attention. They were eventually arrested in 1983 for separate unrelated crimes, Tool for arson and Lucas for unlawful possession of a firearm. The two no-account drifters basked in the glow of celebrity. They wanted to be together. They were lovers. They believed that if they could get put in jail together, they could live as homosexual lovers in jail, have all of this sensationalism and, and, and notoriety, and essentially be the king of the hill in prison for the rest of their lives. That was a motivator. While in custody, Lucas confessed to numerous murders, claiming to have committed nearly 600 and implicating Tool. Many of these claims have now been proven false. Nevertheless, Lucas and Toole were both convicted of multiple murders and sentenced to death, but these were later commuted to life in prison, where they ultimately died. The case is solved, you know, but uh, there's nobody else going to solve them except me. As I started talking to Henry, things just didn't add up. Which of these cases terrified you the most? Okay, for our last video today, we're going to look at serial killers who tormented entire cities and countries, gripping them in some understandable fear. In the autumn of 1984 in Paris, France, two men embarked on a brutal crime spree. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at serial murderers who notoriously terrorized a particular metropolitan area, region, or country. When I was on the street, I, I was a loner. I, I stayed to myself. I really had no contact with people. You know, I didn't think about other people's feelings and needs. David Berkowitz, New York, USA, infamously known as the Son of Sam. Berkowitz terrorized New York City during the mid-1970s. Between 1976 and 1977, Berkowitz carried out a series of shootings, killing six people and wounding seven others. And it's something that we all have to worry about. What is your wife saying? She wouldn't even come out tonight. You know, she cried tonight when she heard that the girl died, that Stacey Marsquitz died. And, uh, 
you know, I said that I was going to take a ride out and see what the feeling was out here, and she didn't want to come. He left cryptic letters at his scenes, taunting the police and media, which heightened public fear and anxiety. Berkowitz claimed that a demonic entity communicated through his neighbor's dog and commanded him to kill. As far as I'm concerned, that, that was not me. I, I hate that name. I despise that name. That, Which name? That moniker, son of Sam. That's, that, that, that was not... That was a demon. The intense manhunt for the son of Sam dominated headlines, capturing the city's collective attention. He was eventually apprehended in August of 1977, bringing relief to the city. Berkowitz was sentenced to six consecutive life terms and remains incarcerated, his actions leaving a lasting scar on New York City. That was just a, a, a break from reality. I thought I was doing something to uh, appease the devil. I'm, I'm sorry for it, but I, I really don't want to talk about it anymore. Appease the devil. Well, I was, uh, at this time, I had, uh, was serving him. You know, I was uh, serving him. I feel that he had taken over my mind and body, and I, I just surrendered to those very dark forces. I regret that with all my heart. Peter Sutcliffe, West Yorkshire, England. The Yorkshire Ripper was a source of enormous fear in the West Yorkshire area of England from 1975 to 1980. The whole of Britain was terrified by the elusive murderer who seemed to kill for his own enjoyment. His brutal attacks on women, resulting in 13 deaths and numerous injuries, caused widespread panic. Sutcliffe's ability to evade capture for years despite intense police efforts added to the public's unease. And even Peter Sutcliffe himself has said, I got to the point where I thought I must be invisible. So he got to a stage where he felt untouchable. He felt so powerful, he thought that he was never going to get caught. His modus operandi often involved bludgeoning and stabbing his targets. Sutcliffe was finally arrested in 1981 for driving with false license plates, leading to his confession. His trial and subsequent life imprisonment brought some relief to a region that had lived in fear for half a decade. Sutcliffe's legacy casts a deathly shadow over the lives he took and the lives he left behind. Andrei Chikatilo, Rostov-on-Don, Russia. This butcher of Rostov was an enduring, horrifying menace in Rostov-on-Don and surrounding areas between 1978 and 1990, and committed the gruesome murders of at least 52 people. When they found some of the victims, you could still see the reflection of horror in their eyes. It was very hard to look at. Chikatilo's killings were marked by extreme violence, including including mutilation and cannibalism. The Soviet authorities struggled to capture him, often misdirected by the assumption that the killer had mental health issues or was unhoused. Despite clear evidence that a serial killer was on the loose, Soviet police and the Communist Party-controlled media refused to release any information. In the absence of real facts, rumors spread throughout the region. Chikatilo's eventual arrest in 1990 came after he was spotted at a murder scene and linked through blood evidence. His trial revealed the horrifying details, and he was executed in 1994, ending one of Russia's most infamous criminal sprees. In the aftermath of his execution, writers, reporters, and victims' families attempted to find some trace of humanity in Andrei Chikatilo. But in many ways, this man, who committed extraordinarily cruel crimes, remains an enigma. Ivan Milat, New South Wales, Australia. Dubbed the Backpacker Murderer, Milat was responsible for the deaths of seven backpackers in New South Wales between 1989 and 1992. Police describe the murders as premeditated, committed with unspeakable horror, cruelty and savagery. The victims' remains were discovered in the Belangolo State Forest, showing signs of brutal torture. The case instilled deep fear among travellers in Australia. His actions so twisted and so evil that to the world, he'll always be known simply and notoriously as the backpacker murderer. Malat's arrest in 1994 followed a meticulous investigation that linked him to the murders through forensic evidence and survivor testimony. His trial in 1996 resulted in life imprisonment without parole. Malat's crimes had a profound impact on the perception of safety for international backpackers in Australia. How would you describe the mind of Ivan Malat? I think the mind of a monster. He was definitely a man with a very evil side to him, a man who got to his kicks out of uh, these deviant acts, if you like. Jack the Ripper, London, England. Jack the Ripper is one of history's most enigmatic serial killers, active in London's Whitechapel district in 1888. In the autumn of 1888, the East End of London lived in terror. 
the killer's modus operandi involved gruesome mutilations of at least five women, primarily women who worked in the sex trade. The lack of a clear suspect, despite numerous investigations, contributed to a climate of fear and speculation. They were under a lot of pressure to solve these cases, identify this individual. The mystery surrounding Jack the Ripper's identity has inspired countless theories and extensive media coverage over the years. The case remains unsolved, but it has left an indelible mark on London's history, symbolizing the darker aspects of the Victorian era. Even at the time of the murders, you know, he was becoming mythology. And then you start getting the man with the top hat and the cape and the little bag. So he's almost being given a supervillain image that people can latch onto. Richard Ramirez, Los Angeles, USA. The Night Stalker was the embodiment of terror in Los Angeles during 1984 and 1985. The Night Stalker killed at least 13 times, 13 people who were awakened in the night to face death. At least 15 others survived his brutal attack. His string of atrocities included home invasions, assaults, and murders, often accompanied by satanic rituals. Ramirez's random and brutal methods caused widespread panic. He targeted people of all ages, killing 14 people and committing numerous other acts of violence. Satan is a stabilizing force in my life. It gives me a reason to be an excuse to rationalize. Ramirez was finally captured in August 1985 when citizens in East Los Angeles recognized him and restrained him until police arrived. His trial and conviction brought an end to one of the most fear-inducing crime sprees in Los Angeles history. He had no empathy, no feelings, uh, nothing. He never showed any remorse uh, for what he had done. He wanted to be known as the greatest serial killer that ever, you know, ever lived. Luis Garavito, Colombia. The Beast is one of the world's most prolific serial killers. Committing his crimes in various regions of Colombia, South America in the 1990s, he eluded Colombia's authorities for nine long years. His reign of monstrosity included being responsible for the deaths of over 138 boys in Colombia during the 1990s. Garavito attracted his victims with promises of gifts or money before torturing and killing them. The discovery of mass graves and the extent of his horrors shocked the nation. The results were simple. Garavito had been in every one of the crime locations. Investigators fed hotel reports, testimonies, and evidence into the system. And what came out was confirmation that Garavito was their man. Garavito was apprehended in 1999, and his detailed confessions revealed the horrifying scale of his atrocities. He was sentenced to 1,853 years in prison, a sentence that, while significant, still seemed insufficient for the lives he took. Garavito defended himself by saying that in every instance, he had been possessed by a malignant spirit. Thierry Paulin, Paris, France. Thierry Paulin, known as the Monster of Montmartre, brutally killed at least 21 elderly women in Paris during the 1980s. Two men embarked on a brutal crime spree. In just six weeks, they attacked nine elderly women in their homes, intent on taking their money and their lives. Bodies were often found savagely beaten and strangled, with their homes robbed of valuables. Paulin created a climate of fear, particularly among the elderly. I don't think we can say that he was a serial killer, because a serial killer is a sadistic individual who takes pleasure in killing, who kills for the sake of it, for the pleasure of killing. That wasn't Paulin. He kills for money. There was a police officer from the La Brigade Criminale who said, he killed like he was going to the bank. I don't think he even realized the horror of what he had done. He attacked old ladies, he killed them, but in fact he acted as if he was going to get money from the ATM. But he killed them so they couldn't tell anyone. With the proceeds from his crimes, he lived a lifestyle that included drugs, clubbing, and lavish parties. Paulin was arrested in 1987 after a failed robbery and confessed to his crimes while in custody. He died of AIDS in 1989, leaving behind a legacy of horror in the Parisian community. Paulin escaped the trial. Unfortunately, it was AIDS that killed him. And of course, we can lament the fact that the mastermind, the instigator, was never brought to justice. This much is clear. Forgive me for being crude, but the criminal justice system took what was left. In other words, Maturin. Maturin was on trial for the murder of eight women in just over one month during the autumn of 1984. The details of the slayings were shocking, even to Maturin's defense lawyer, Michel Arnaud. Fritz Haumann, 
Hanover, Germany. Yet another butcher nicknamed killer, the Butcher of Hanover was active in the 1920s, preying on young men and boys in Hanover. Haumann lured unsuspecting victims with promises of work or shelter, only to murder and dismember them. He sold off their personal belongings, with his actions also leading to rumors of cannibalism. Haumann was arrested in 1924 after a thorough investigation linked him to the disappearance of numerous youths. His trial revealed the extent of his gruesome acts, and he was executed by guillotine in 1925, bringing an end to one of Germany's most notorious crime sprees. Javed Iqbal, Lahore, Pakistan. This depraved killer confessed to the murders of 100 boys in Lahore during the late 1990s. His detailed accounts included keeping photographs of bodies and then dumping them to dissolve in acid. Iqbal's arrest in 1999 followed his own letters to the police and newspapers, outlining his crimes. The case highlighted severe deficiencies in Pakistan's child protection systems and shocked the entire nation. Ball was sentenced to death, but he died under suspicious circumstances in his cell before the sentence could be carried out, leaving many questions unanswered. What other infamous killers could have made this list? All right, well, that's going to do it for this terrifying descent into the world of serial killers. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo, and I'll see you next time.